Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. Hey everyone, we are quickly closing in on the event we've all been waiting for, TwimbleCon AI Platforms, now just under a month away. We have seen plenty of folks take advantage of our early registration discount. And if you've been planning to do so, but summer or procrastination got the best of you, you are running out of time. Early registration for TwimbleCon ends this Friday, which means ticket prices jump from $5.99 to $7.49, once the weekend starts. Don't miss out on the opportunity to save $150 on your registration. And whatever you do, don't miss the opportunity to join us at TwimbleCon to learn, share, and connect with your peers working to automate, accelerate, and scale machine learning and deep learning in your organizations. Visit twimblecon.com slash register to register. And if you have any questions about the event, we'll be available right there via chat to answer them for you. Hope to see you soon. All right, everyone. I am on the line with Lata Branson. Lata is a scientific researcher at Sci Sports. Lata, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Oh, thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to chatting with you. You are in the enviable position of having combined a couple of your life's passions. You've been playing soccer since the age of five, and now you get to study it uh, and apply machine learning to uh, the analysis of uh, that sport and uh, and others as well. Or are you primarily focused on soccer right now? Um, I'm just focused on soccer right now. Yeah. Uh, so how did this all come to be? Um, well, as you already mentioned, I uh, I played soccer my whole my life, um, and I uh, did a bachelor's in uh, in mathematics. And while I was studying, uh, I found out of this company called Sci Sports that was uh, well using uh, was combining mathematics and uh, and soccer to uh, to get insights in uh, well in what players uh, clubs should buy. So then I contacted uh, the company, and the company back then was just uh, well run by uh, by three students. Uh, it was uh, just the beginning of the company, it's around five years ago, and uh, I kept in contact. I worked there like uh, one day a week, and then I uh, started doing my master's in econometrics. And uh, well, at the end of my master's, I could uh, could work at the company as a scientific researcher. So that's how it all started. And the company's based in Amsterdam. It's based in. Uh, well, it started in Enschede. It's like in the in the east of uh, of the country, okay. but we have a very small country, so that's uh, well around two hours from Amsterdam. Okay. Um, and uh, we also have an office in Amersfoort right now. That is like in the middle of uh, of Netherlands. And from the time you started working there, when it was just the three students, uh, it's grown to what now? To around uh, fifty people right now. So in just six years, uh, big growth. Talk a little bit about, before we dive into the specific paper that we'll be uh, speaking about, uh, talk a little bit about kind of your general area of, of research there. Yeah, so so we uh, at SciSports, we, uh, well, we help multiple uh, different clients, but our main focus is on, uh, on the recruitment part for clubs. So, um, well, they actually, uh, all clubs want to find new uh, new players to uh for their teams, and that's where we help. And uh, in our team, our data analytics team, we uh, we built uh, well new models, uh, mainly using machine learning, to get insights um, from this data that we get. Um, and that's how we uh, well we help the clubs. And we have like a, an online platform uh, where um, well where our clients can find around 90,000 nine zero um, uh, players from all over the world and can find their strengths and weaknesses. And uh, well, that's how they, how we help them. Okay. Uh, what are some of the main data sources that you have access to for the various uh, analytics that you do? Yeah, we got uh, access to uh, to match event data, as it is called. Uh, we uh, we get this from our partner, Wisecout. And this data that is uh, like manually annotated, uh, like for every action that, uh, that occurs on the pitch. So uh, in a pass, a dribble, a cross. It's all annotated, uh, which player performs this action from where to where or what time in the match. And that's the kind of data that we, uh, we deal with uh, daily. Okay. And so the data is a 
kind of a set of time series events or yeah yeah it is yeah okay. it is yeah okay and are there other data source providers that are doing things with uh, more imagery or video based data or is that not uh, prevalent in soccer yet? It is. We have a, a part of our company is working on uh, on that. We have a special team. Uh, it's called the Bo James team, and they uh, they're working on the scanner system, which currently hangs in the three stadiums. Um, and that is like using this uh, computer vision to uh, well to track the players and the ball uh, at uh, well uh, each moment, uh, each time in the game. So that's also uh, what we're doing. So we're also collecting data, um, but my team is primarily focused on uh, event data uh, for the clubs. Because, uh, well, to scout players, you have to know uh, a lot about all these players around the world. And uh, this video uh, data is not yet uh, uh, provided for a lot of leaks. So mm. uh, that's why. Oh, makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, so the paper that we are going to dig into is one that you presented uh, earlier this year at the uh, the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. It's called Choke or Shine quantifying soccer players ability to perform under mental pressure tell us a little bit about the motivations for this paper yeah so uh, well it's it's about quantifying what it says uh, the soccer players abilities to perform under mental pressure and what we actually want to do is um well we saw there's a lot of research in uh, soccer analytics uh, currently it's it's growing fastly but there's never any research quantitatively done about uh, how players perform uh, under under mental pressure. And uh, well, I've also, as a f- soccer player myself, uh, I also feel this uh, pressure uh, sometimes. So it's actually how we uh, how we came uh, well with this uh, with this topic. Yeah. So we w- wanted to measure the performance of these players when the pressure is getting high. So we we had access to the data for this, and that's actually how we uh, how we started this research. And we did a collaboration with um, two uh, two people from the KU Leuven. Peter, uh, Peter and Jesse and uh, another colleague of mine, uh, Jan, uh, we did this uh, research. And is applying some kind of you know, machine learning or analytics to mental pressure, is that something that you've seen done in other fields? Is it you know prevalent in some other fields and it's something you're trying to bring to soccer or is it something that we don't really do a lot of now in sports? It, it is. It has been uh, investigated in some other sports, but not extensively yet. So I think it's still a field that uh, needs to be investigated more. We also want to do more in uh, research to this. And we've spoken to quite some uh, mental coaches that work at different clubs. And they always tell us that they have like, um, it's hard for them to, to show like the improvement of certain players on uh, well, certain aspects uh, of the mental uh, mental game. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, well, in soccer, it's well, in all sports, um, it's very important that you uh, that the men- mentality is, uh, is is correct, so uh, that you can perform under mental pressure, because that's the, when the points are uh, are being made. So uh, yeah, yeah. And so, how are you in your research defining mental pressure, and how are you characterizing it in the games that you're looking at? Yeah. So actually, what we what we did, we defined two aspects of the mental pressure. So the pre-game. Uh, pressure and the um, in-game pressure so you can imagine that uh, before a game starts there's already some pressure on certain games for example when uh, um, <clears throat> when you're playing a game for the championship like in the Premier League so like uh, I think it was 10 years ago something like that maybe a less, bit less when uh, uh, City and United Manchester City and United both could be uh, the champions um, well then the, the pressure is getting high um, and we also investigated the in-game uh, mental pressure, and that's based on an in-game uh, win probability model. So at each point in time, we uh, predict uh, well the the, in, uh, the win probability for both of the teams. And when uh, a change in uh, when a goal has been scored, when the, this in-game win probability will change a lot, then we say like the pressure is high. So for example, when it's like a uh, one one in the last minute, then the pressure is really high because when mm-hmm. you score a goal, this will ma- mainly change uh, the winner of the game. But when there's already a three uh, three zero score on the on the board, then it doesn't matter anymore. And so you've kind of characterized games uh, by this low pressure, high pressure, or at least the the pregame is the 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 pressure is you know at the level of the game, but 
the in game that's uh, an attribute you're applying to the games. Is it minute by minute or event by event? Or I guess it's just whenever the score changes. Yeah. So that's actually whenever the choice. It's actually minute by minute. Um, okay. So it's um, yeah. So when the score changes, it will immediately uh, affect uh, this model. And it takes into account like the current score, also like whether there are red cards, uh, yellow cards, um, and the kind of stuff. And also like uh, when a when a, play, a team is attacking uh, a lot, they will also account for that in the win, uh, in-game win probability model. So yeah, that's uh, that's it. And like for the pre-game uh, mo- model, it's like a fixed uh, well a set number per game. Yeah. And those two combined make like the pressure at a certain event uh, in a game. Okay. And so you're you've got the the you've got the pressure on the one hand, and you're trying to use that to predict what. So we actually um, have the pressure on the one hand, and on the other hand, we have uh, actually three uh, performance metrics. Um, so we for every action that we have, so this pass, uh, a pass or a dribble, we uh, compute three things. So the contribution of this um, of this action. So by contribution, we mean um, the increase in um, scoring a goal in the near future. So actually, for every action, we we compute uh, the value of the game before the action and after the action, and the difference in those two makes the the contribution of an of an action. And next to that, we also um, measure the decision, the quality of the decision, and the quality of the execution. And those three, for those three values, we can see like how does a player perform, but when the pressure is like in a normal normal state when it's getting high and when it's getting lower and this is more like for descriptive uh, analysis of all those players this contribution element it sounds like that's saying that at a given time in the game given all of the player positions and some event that just happened you're able to come up with some metric that captures kind of the relative advantage of the the different teams that in and of itself sounds like a hard problem yeah, it is. Yeah, so we. Uh, <laughs> it, that was actually how this all uh, this all started. So um, I think a year before this paper, um, we worked on a model um, to measure these contributions for all the for all the players. Um, so this what this actually does is <clears throat> for each of uh, for each game state, that's how how we how we how we call it. So every game state is like uh, characterized by um, um, all the actions that have been. Played until then, the position of the the player with the ball, um, the the time the time in the match, the score difference, um, and then for every game state we uh, predict um, the chance that within um, ten actions a goal is being scored by the one team. So it's actually like a binary class, uh, classification problem. And we also, on the other hand, we also uh, predict the chance that the other team will score within ten actions. And in this way we can measure like. Uh, for every action, we can measure the offensive and, on the other hand, the defensive contribution. So, for example, when a player passes the ball from his own half to his uh, striker, this will have like a very high contribution, uh, offensive contribution. But on the, on the other hand, if you intercept the ball in your own box, you will also have a high uh, defensive contribution. And that's what we, uh, well, what we were first worked on, and this is uh, also something that we uh, already show to our to our clients. And, we, and they can find like players that have like, for example, high pass contribution. Um, and we can easily uh, spot talents before other uh, others do. With that original work on contribution, uh, I guess a couple of questions there. One, mm-hmm. uh, when you're looking at player position, like do you quantize that in some way, or is it kind of continuous position in the field? You mean like what position? You mean? Where where the player is with the ball. Okay, yeah. Or and do you even look at where the players are that don't have the ball? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. That's one of the the well disadvantages of the event data. So um, with this event data, we only have all the actions that that happen with the ball. So we have the passes, the dribbles, but uh, we don't know where all the other uh, well twenty one players are. Yeah. So that's uh well that is. Did tough you call sometimes. that an an advantage or a disadvantage? Disadvantage. Okay. Yeah. Disadvantage, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <It's an> advantage because <laughs> it makes your no. problem easier. But <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no. We I would really love to have this uh, this data as well. Yeah. Um, but we currently don't have that. Um, but we uh, also captured. Well, we tried to capture this with by adding information about the attack. So uh, we um, 
we add information about the speed of the game. So um, so in, in, in the soccer, yeah, like you, you have quite a lot of counter attacks. So you know, like when the game moved fast, so the ball moved fast to the to the other half, then we know like this is a different situ- situation than um, when the ball was when it was a very slow attack. Um, so that's the kind of things that we try to uh, to account for. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, we don't have these uh, all these locations now. Yeah, yeah, it does seem like there is potentially an interesting element of player contribution that is, you know, being in the right place at the right time yeah, that yeah. can't be captured in your current model. Yeah. That's true. But we're also looking at um, where a player receives the ball, and that mm-hmm. also already tells a lot about his positioning. Okay. But it's also, yeah. So if you he often receives the ball in the, in the opponent's box, um, that says a lot about his positioning uh, we've seen. And so uh, back to that positioning question, are you... Like, do you kind of split the field up into zones or, you know, meter by meter squares or something like that? Or are you using kind of yeah. absolute positioning? We uh, we get it like in uh, meter by meter. Um, that's actually also what we use in the... So actually, you have the, um, it's annotated as like a 100 by 100 uh, uh, pitch. And then we normalize it to like the uh, the normal pitch sizes in the, in Europe or in like I think over overall the world. Uh, so that's uh, how we use it. So it's kind of meter by meter, yeah. All right. So you've got this contribution data, and that becomes the uh, that's another one of the inputs to your your choke or shine model. Actually, is it the is it the contribution that's trying to predict whether a point will be scored in ten? actions or is that yeah the... yeah that's a contribution so actually that's uh, the contribution is the difference in uh, scoring a goal before your action and after your action ah got it so if bef- so for example if you have it on your own half the, the chance of scoring a goal uh, within 10 uh, 10 actions will be very low and then if it after the action is very is higher then it's the difference between those and if you lose the ball you get negative contribution uh, ratings and so then you're Taking this in as an input, uh, and then using this to, I'm trying to get back to the the mm-hmm. the okay. choke or shine model. How does yeah, the yeah. contribution play into the mental pressure model? So um, what we actually do is we uh, investigate the moments in which the uh, well, actually we investigate how, what a normal contribution is for a certain player. So in that way we can can uh, identify uh, the talents, for example. So we did this for the MLS. Um, for example, we saw that that um, lets me see the names: uh, Alfonso Davies um, and uh, Barco and uh, Adams, Tarder Adams, were in like in the 2018 uh, season, were like the players with the highest contribution ratings in the um, um, in the MLS. So what we actually do, we have these contribution ratings per action. And if we then um, sum up all this, these ratings for a certain player and then we normalize this per uh, per 90 minutes of play, then we can actually uh, say, like, what is his average contribution for, for a game? Um, and then when we looked at, for example, Alfonso Davies, when uh, the pressure was normal, he belongs to the best players in the in the league. But actually, when the pressure is getting high, he belongs to, like, more like an average player, even below average. Okay. Um, so that was kind of the insight that we were looking for. Um, to see like how do, do, play, do players perform uh, when it's, this pressure is normal or high or low. So actually we bind uh, the, the pressure levels that we had in like three bins, and that's how we uh, identified this. Um, and because we, we saw like, okay, we see this contribution is changing, but we want, also wanted to know like, why is this, this changing? And then we came up with the idea like, okay, the contribution rating of a player, it depends actually on two things. So contribution of an action depends actually on the choice that you made and also on how you execute this action. So the choice can be to to play the ball to your striker as a defender, but if you don't execute it well, you will never get a high contribution. And on the other hand, if you make a wrong choice, um, but you execute the action in a good way, then it also will not give you a high contribution rating. So that's what we're kind of looking for. So um, to see why um, these ratings are changing for changing for certain players. So that's actually what we did. Um, and we also looked into more like tactical uh, analysis. So, for example, Manchester United, uh, they tend to uh, dribble um, less. 
uh, dribble more when the pressure is getting high, but actually their contribution from the dribbles is decreasing. So they're choosing to dribble, then it's not a good decision to do that. Um, so that's kind of the insight that we, uh, we were looking at. And so were you able to arrive at the you know, decision-making and execution as were these outputs of this model or were these inputs to the model? Those are like inputs to the complete model, yeah. So these are also based on the, on the data that we got. Yeah. So you have this, this data that's telling you if a pass is made and then is execution just telling you if the pass was completed or if it was not completed? And so does it, it doesn't really take into account defense contribution at all? No, this this no, this is uh, focused on um, well on the difficulty of the uh, of the action. So if you uh, pass a long ball uh, um, and you manage to succeed, you will get a higher execution rating. Mm -hmm. um, but also, like a tackle can also uh, uh, so tackles defensive action that can also be unsuccessful, or you can also make a foul in the in your own box. Um, so it also does take into account defensive actions, but. Uh, well, we know that that using event data, it's very hard to um, to rate players on the defensive actions because well, more things happen with the ball in the, in offense. So that's that's hard. Yeah, that's one of the the legs uh, of the data. And is the data is there? Is it labeled or rated in terms of the intended target for a pass, or is it? just that a pass happened and the next event is whether the, you know, if the pass uh, was received or if someone intercepted it. Yeah, that's actually, yeah, we know the end location of the pass, so we know the direction of it. And in that way we can kind of predict where it was going to. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we know the uh, end location. Yeah. All right. So uh, tell us a little bit about the, the process of coming up with the, this model, how did you start and what were some of the things that you tried? So, well, we actually started with like having uh, lots of discussions and, uh, well, thinking of how we want to, wanted to measure this. So, uh, well, as I, as I said before, we worked together with two, uh, two people from the Leuven University. So they visited us and, uh, cause Leuven is in, uh, is in Belgium. So they visited, visited us at, uh, at Amersfoort at our office. And we had just had like one week just discussing, uh, no programming, just discussing how we wanted to do this. Um, and that's how we came up with uh, the different models that we wanted to capture. And our main thing was you also wanted to try as much as possible and get see how far we got uh, in all of those aspects. And we we know like uh, some things are hard to capture with the, with the data that we have. Um, so we first started with how to, uh, we already had this contribution ratings. So we tried to improve those, uh, train it on more data, uh, try some different models for that. Um, and uh, the main focus was in the beginning on the, how to measure this, this uh, mental pressure. Um, so for the, the pregame uh, uh, me mental pressure model, we wanted to, well, uh, to, we needed some kind of ground food to, to train this model. So that's how, why we, uh, um, well, talk to some soccer experts. That's how we call them. So soccer players, uh, trainers, coaches, uh, scouts from clubs. And we let them, um, well, we made like a tool where they could like uh, rank uh, games. And we, we gave them information about these games. So uh, uh, was it in the beginning of the season? What is the uh, the ranking of the of the league? Uh, what is the goal of the team? That kind of stuff. And then they uh, they could rank those, those teams. So it was like a pairwise ranking. Mm -hmm. And we use this um, to train uh, to train our pregame uh, mental pressure model. So uh, in this model, uh, we make use of uh, well different features. So as I said before, um, the ranking of the team, uh, how how long the season is uh, already uh, being played. So where in the season are we? Um, and also like uh, on what spot are they? So if they are playing for a uh, Europa League uh, spot, then the pressure will be higher than uh, when they are already re relegated, for example. Um, so that's actually how we started by making this tool and collecting as, mu as much input as possible. Also, t also talking to uh, to these people to to ask them what do you think is like important? Uh, when do you feel the pressure? Um, that's actually how it started, and then we uh, kept on improving. Uh, and so with that, the pressure model. Were you training against uh, subjective? 
labels of whether a game was high pressure or not? Yeah, so actually the the, the rank uh, the rank labels by the by our uh, uh, experts. Yeah. Okay. So that so that's the pressure model. Um, and then what kind of model did you use for that? So for the the pre game uh, pressure model, we used it gradient boosted uh, ranking trees. And for the for the in game uh, um, mental pressure model, uh, that's so so for that model, we wanted to um, predict that every time, so every minute in the game, um, the sum of the goals, what are the number of goals that both teams would score, and then we could like predict the probabilities of win, uh, draw, and uh, and uh, and loss. And for this model, um, we made use of uh, the auto uh, differentiation variational inference of uh, pi m c three. Um, and we trained this on uh, well on all the data that we had uh, up until the 2017-2018 season. Um, so yeah, that's actually how we uh, how we trained these two models and the com- a combination of those two pressure models. So the in-game and the uh, pre-game um, yeah, makes us the pressure model. How are those combined? Yeah, so that's where we also had uh, well difficulty. Um, <laughs> Or difficult is like it's very hard to. Um, I think in, in the in I think it's in many areas, but in sports it's it's kind of hard if you don't really have a, a ground truth. Um, so uh, in the end, we uh, we decided to uh, to multiply those two numbers. Um, so it's the the in game and the pre game. So uh, when the pre game pressure is high, but in in the game it's it's quickly gets to a three uh, three zero score. So there's not really high pressure anymore. Then the total pressure will be uh, will be low as well. Um, and uh, but we certainly wanted to do uh, to want to do more investigation. In this uh, you should just collect more uh, more information on that. You mentioned some of the kind of surprising findings from looking at some of the MLS uh, players. Were there any other kind of interesting surprises in when you started applying these results? Um, yeah, there were like lots of. Uh, uh, Results that we, uh, well, some that we already, that we also expected. For example, that Cristiano Ronaldo uh, is like very constant under pressure. So, uh, well, that's not nothing new, maybe, but uh, that was it felt good to uh, to see this. Um, but for Neymar, so uh, uh, when he was still playing at Bar- uh, Barcelona, his uh, his performance uh, goes down under pressure. So then he's like more like an average player. Uh, Whilst when the pressure is lower, he belongs like to the best of uh, of the league. Um, yeah, and then um, what we also find really interesting is that Liverpool um, it tends to buy uh, players that perform well under pressure. So um, that's actually just something that we uh, found by accident, but uh, it was interesting to see. So in the our, their signings from the last um, three three seasons were all, except for uh, Kaita, they were all like performing way better under pressure than under uh, under low pressure. Um, so that was interesting to see. Do you think there's anything interesting in looking at kind of the overall team composition of players that perform better in low pressure versus high pressure? Are there any interesting uh, ideas there? Yeah, so we also uh, also looked at that. So uh, we wanted to show as many uh, applications as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, so we looked at um, um, well the defenders of uh, Juventus, for example, and we saw that um, uh, there are two players, uh, Benassia and uh, Bonucci, who like uh, perform way better when the pressure is, uh, is high, and like two others, uh, Chiellini and Rugani, uh, perform uh, way worse under pressure. So this might help coaches to uh, well select the players uh, to to let let them play in a certain match. So when uh, when you're playing like the Champions League final, you might uh, choose uh, Benatia over uh, Chiellini. Um, so we, yeah, there's also uh, some interesting insights in there. So this then goes a bit beyond the kind of scouting uh, use cases that you tend to focus on and could be something that is useful for tactical planning by coaches. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we also uh, well, we we started focusing on uh, on the scouting, but we're currently also like um, doing uh, other stuff for for clubs. So we help them, for example, with the opponent analysis. So finding the weaknesses and the strengths of their opponents. Um, for example, at the previous uh, World Cup, uh, the men's World Cup, <laughs> I must say, um, it was uh, we uh, we helped the Belgium team uh, like. Uh, 
an uh, analyzing their opponents. Um, well, and they came until the, the semifinals, so that was uh, nice as well. Um, so that's also where this, this could be very helpful, yeah. And what I said before, also for mental coaches that want to show um, the staff how, how their progress is with certain players, uh, it's also very helpful to have, to have something to measure this. So it could be used for many, many things, yeah. <laughs> You certainly learned a lot about the kind of the application uh, of some of these models to this problem, but were there any interesting kind of fundamental learnings or observations on the part of you or your team about um, uh, applying these kinds of models to the kinds of data that you were applying it to? It was interesting to see that there are differences between between certain players, but I think definitely we need to uh, to investigate more whether we can also like make it more like a predictive thing uh, to predict uh, the performance of players in the future. So we're looking into that right now. Um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, the main insight is that there there's lots of research to be done still in this in this field, um, and uh, that we are able to capture. Uh, to capture certain things, um, to capture contributions of players and in a better way than just looking at the number of goals scored. Because in in, uh, in soccer, there's like uh, on average just two, two goals uh, per game. Um, so it definitely doesn't always say that the one team was better than the other. Um, so yeah, we've, we found some uh, interesting uh, insights in there. Where did you find the, the most challenges from a technical perspective? Good question. <laughs> um well, we had that it was really hard to get the, the in-game win probability mo- model working well. Um, I think also like it's the the hard thing is to get this uh, this ground truth in, uh, in 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 the, in, uh, in soccer. Um, that's what, what we have to deal with, and we don't have the the uh, locations of the other players. So that was for the decision uh, rating model very hard uh, as well. So I think that's what uh, yeah from technical side. Uh, was hard to get it all working uh, in a good way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think also, th- yeah, not just not from a technical side, but one of the problems is I think uh, to get this this message across to uh, to people from the industry, from the soccer world. <laughs> so the, just the applicability of, of machine learning and analytics in general, or the uh, specifically around looking at mental pressure? I, I think in general, but like especially in uh, in mental pressure, um, like also like the mental aspect of the game, if uh, well of analyzing the mental aspect is very new um, in 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 most sports, and then also like using data for that is like uh, for for people in the in the in the soccer industry that's uh, maybe a bit too early right now. Right, right. <laughs> but um, no, no, yeah. <laughs> So we uh, well we tried to uh, to to inform them how they could use this. Um, so that's also what we're investigating right now: how we can best present this to uh, to the users. I should have asked this earlier, but um, assuming that kind of the testing of your models was done against kind of held out data, uh, did you? Mm-hmm. How do you test this against kind of real world scenarios? Do, have you done any of that? Yeah. So, for for example, the well, actually, all of the models we we used like um, uh, three seasons of data for that, like to train the models, and uh, to validate it on another season, and then uh, uh, like the the results were presented on the well on the season that we didn't uh, train or validate it on. So, uh, for example, for the for the contribution uh, rating aspect, we have like uh, we have like the ground truth. That's our like the the label is. When a goal is being scored within 10 actions, the, the label will be one and you're otherwise zero. Um, so that's how we, uh, well, how we train that model. Mm-hmm. And for the others, we, uh, for, for the pressure model, uh, as explained, uh, we used uh, the ranking uh, provided by, uh, by the experts um, to get that one working. Very good. Well, Lota, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us about your paper. It's really interesting stuff. Yeah, thanks. I uh, enjoyed it. <laughs> All right, everyone, that's our show for today. For more information on Lata or any of our other guests, visit TwimmelAI.com. Be sure to register for TwimmelCon AI platforms now before prices go up this Saturday, September 7th. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.